Blake, are you familiar with the term calling an audible? Are you about to throw an audible right now? Because that's not what I was expecting you to say. Oh, yeah. Welcome to the Church Gear Podcast, where we pull the tech director out of the booth and onto the stage to share the most outlandish stories and hidden wisdom from the tech trenches. And now, here are your hosts. I'm your host, Blake Hodges, the only person at Church Gear who has hit Toby's house with a company van. And I'm here with my co-host, a man who can back down a driveway with ease, Toby Walters. You did hit my house with a van. And it was like my second week, too. Yeah, the van was like, I had just gotten it a month before. Thankfully, though, someone ended up rear-ending the van, so it kind of washed away my sins. Yeah, you can't see your sins anymore. Yeah, that was nice. Okay, so uh, it, it, we're going to call an audible, Blake. Today is the day. Are, are you a little nervous? I am a little nervous. Because I'm going off script here. I, uh, I keep you pretty on script. You knew this was coming, and I figure, you know, we are kind of feel like we have the, the biggest guest in the space, so I feel like we need the biggest story okay, to go with it. it. Um, so my dad is in town visiting Blake. Oh, I love your dad. He's a very nice guy. So my dad is 77 now. And six years ago, uh, six and a half years ago, we moved into our new house and my parents came to visit and my dad, well, he's 70 at the time. And my parents, they've been married for, I don't know, 400 years, but my mom makes my dad sleep upstairs because he snores when they come to our house. Oh, how nice. So she gets the guest room. He has to go upstairs. And as he's gotten older, he's like, he's never, he's always been a good Baptist boy. So he didn't really drink. Mm. But as he's gotten older, he's having, he's had trouble falling asleep. So he'll have like a glass of wine before bed. So to a help bad him get Baptist to sleep. boy, a bad Baptist boy now. So they come to visit and we're supposed to have wine on hand for my dad so he can go to sleep. But we forgot. And we usually don't have much alcohol in the house. Like we're not big drinkers. We're not we're not good or bad Baptist boys. We're just indifferent, I would say. So my dad, you know, that first evening they arrive, he says, well, where's the wine? And we're like, oh, man, we forgot the wine. And he kind of rolls his eyes. He makes a big show of it. He's like, I'll go out and get some wine. And then my wife remembered that somebody had given us a housewarming present like a year before. Or no, it was a we had gone to like a friend's like party and we had won it as a door prize. And it was a bottle of Maker's Mark. Oh, nice. Have you had Maker's Mark, Blake? Yes, it's a nice weeded bourbon. It's a good uh, affordable sipper. It's not, you know, top shelf, but it's not bottom shelf. It's it's a good bottle. Okay. So again, not really a big drinker. So we hadn't touched it. So my wife said, oh, wait, we have this bottle of Maker's Mark in the cabinet. You can have a little of that. That'll help you. You know, there's there's alcohol in that. So, so I want it to be said, he's never really had bourbon. Let's, let's put that out there as so, we tell this story. Yes, and he, he doesn't know that, you know, he doesn't really, I mean, he knows bourbon is an alcohol. Yeah. He says, okay, fine. I'll take that. And if I need help sleeping, I'll have it available. So he goes upstairs, gets ready for bed and takes a sleeping pill. Oh, around seven, seven thirty in the evening. He's old. He goes to bed early. Rocking that Lunesta vibes. Let's do it. So he goes to bed and he wakes up around midnight and can't sleep. So he goes into the bathroom and as he would do with wine, he pours himself a glass of whiskey. Oh, boy. And when I mean glass of whiskey, I don't mean shot glass. I mean literally red solo cup. Your dad said this is a sipping bourbon or rather a chugging bourbon. A chugging bourbon. My dad chugged a red solo cup filled with Maker's Mark bourbon. So this story ends with your dad dying, right? Well, we'll get there. So he ch and he said later on, he's like, I remember drinking this stuff and it was just awful. It tasted like gasoline. It was burning my throat. I'm honestly impressed that he was able to do it. Even with my seasoned taste buds, I don't think I could, I mean, not gun to my head probably, but that would be difficult. So he goes back to sleep and around six or six 30 in the morning, my wife is downstairs with our toddler and they're just kind of like, they had just gotten up. My toddler was kind of like, you know, playing around with toys. And Shelly hears my dad wake up upstairs and start giggling uncontrollably. And so she's starting to think like, what in the world is going on up there? And she assumed that our dog had gone up and started licking his face. And we think that actually did happen. 
So she is downstairs. She looks up the stairs, like through the kitchen and up the stairway and sees my dad come to the top of the stairs and stand there. And she's a little confused because he's all wobbly. And he's 70. Remember, he's 70 70 years years old. So our stairs, the way they work, you come down three stairs and you hit this landing and then the stairs split. So one, um, one stairwell goes to the front door. One goes down to the kitchen. Fancy house. And they're hardwood stairs. Even fancier. My, my my dad makes the three steps to the landing, sticks the landing at the top of the landing. And then he loses his balance, rolls down the stairs towards the front door, hits hit the temple of his head on the knob of the banister at the bottom and straight up knocks himself out and lands on the front rug in front of the front door. And dies. And so my wife is like, oh my gosh, she runs upstairs. I'm still asleep. It's like six in the morning. You don't care about your dad. Just no, sleeping not through all six of this. in the morning. So she wakes me up and says, Toby, your dad fell down the stairs and I don't know if he's alive. I've and fallen I'm, and I can't get up. Oh, <laughs> life alert. So I'm trying to shake off the rust and I run downstairs and my dad is like, he's face down on the rug, not moving. And so I put my hands on his back and push on him and say, dad, dad, are you okay? You're like Simba right now from Lion King. I know. So the first thing I hear out of my dad is, So he's alive. He's alive. He's breathing. Praise he's, the Lord. Yes. A giant snore comes out of him. So my mom comes out of the guest room, sees what's happening and says, well, call 911. So we call 911 and the, the hospital is so close to our house. It takes like five minutes. So the paramedics come in and there's two of them and they, you know, start to try and rouse my dad and try and get him to wake up. And they're trying to ask him, like, sir, what did you take? Because obviously they've seen this before and they assumed he overdosed on something. So I I remember this image so clearly. The two paramedics are leaning over my dad and my wife is leaning over him. And they're working together to roll him over. So they roll him over. And Blake, have you ever like seen old Looney Tunes cartoons? Oh, totally. Like Elmer Bugs Fudd, Bunny. Bugs Bunny. And, yeah. You ever seen Peppy Le Pew? Ooh, I think he got, he got canceled, but yes. So Pepe Le Pew had these fumes that would, you know, they were drawn into the cartoon and they would just kind of waft out of him because he was stinky. So it was like they rolled him over and the fumes came off my dad and the two paramedics and my wife all at the same time were like, whoa, and just waved their hands in front of their faces to try and get the smell away. And they're like, well, there it is. There's the whiskey. And so they're trying to, you know, wake him up, get him coherent enough. They can get him on a stretcher. And he is vacillating between just uncontrollable laughter to crying like out of fear and worry because he doesn't know what's happening. (laughs) This has got to be the worst couple hours in his life. He's up drunk as a skunk. So they take him to the hospital and he essentially has to sober up in the hospital for like 30 hours. At 8 a.m., so eight hours after he started drinking, they measured his blood alcohol level at 2.6. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. (laughs) So, yeah. Dad, first time ever being drunk, first time ever having bourbon. Bravo for doing it upright. Man, well, you know, there's only two people in this whole world that I think could drink a whole red solo cup of bourbon and not die. One of them is your dad. And the other one is the co-founder of MXU and front of house mixing master for many, a man who could definitely survive a fall down a stairwell, Lee Fields. Lee, welcome to the show, man. I have no words after that story. (laughs) I could not drink that, by the way. So take me off that freaking list. Well, you could probably drink it. But the question is, would you still be living after you did? No. And the fact that like he was giggling during a hangover, because that's what that was. It's crazy. He was a very happy drunk. It's honestly, I'm look, I'm not going to over spiritualize it, but he should have died. Like, I think we can just, we can put that out there multiple times. Like the Lord must have saved him. Totally. So Lee, I need you to lie to me. I know you're, you're a good Christian man, but uh, it would be very helpful. So on these, let's see, we got six from you. I'm going to read them and then we'll react to your, your truths and lies. 
And what are these? Are you just assuming our audience knows our shtick already? Well, essentially, to introduce somebody, we will... You know, it'd be boring to be like, give me your bio info. Where aren't you going to school? Especially when yeah. you do it in that voice. Yeah, forget that. Um, see, that's a nerdy nerd voice. I can use that voice. And so uh, I'm going to read these out and we'll guess which one is the lie. So number one, was invited to play percussion in an all Eastern U.S. invitational youth orchestra. It's age 16. There you go. Number two, turned down a scholarship to play bass guitar at a major university to pursue music, working in the music industry and mixing. Number three, once sat beside Justin Bieber in church. Oh man, I want that one to be true. I think that one definitely is. Number four, favorite hobby is wine tasting? In red solo cups? I I would have taken you to be more of a bourbon guy. Um, number five, has been to 32 national parks. Oh, that one's definitely true. Are there 32 national parks? Like That's how many good, are there? That's true. And then number six, started mixing at age 15. Okay. okay, this I started mixing at age thirteen, so already I feel like I'm I'm more qualified to be in this space than Lee Fields. There's an Instagram poll right there. Who's the better mixer, Toby or Lee Fields? <laughs> Definitely I mean, Toby. Yeah, United only invited one of us out on tour with them, but I'm not going to say which one. <laughs> okay, so one of these is a lie. I'm going to go ahead and say that it's uh, the number five. Been to 32 national parks. I know you're Dang a national it. parks guy, but 32 is a lot. And I was going to guess that, too. But now I feel like that would be stupid of me to guess what Blake guessed. Normally, I riff too much trying to think of an answer here, and I have to bandwagon on him. So take that. I'm going to go with that as well. Like, I almost wonder, are there 32 national parks? I mean, Teddy Roosevelt would be very disappointed in me right now. I've been He'd watching. Be super disappointed. Yeah. I've been watching the new documentary on Netflix about the national parks. So I know there's tons, but it's just, Lee, you're too busy to have been to 32. So I think we're locking that in. What's what's your lie? Uh, the lie is my favorite hobby is wine tasting is a Ooh. lie. What is your favorite hobby? Um, I probably hunting. So something with the outdoors, bow hunting specifically. That's probably my favorite hobby. I should have known it was the wine tasting. Yeah. I, I, that felt personality wise, but strategically I was like, he could have been to 31 national parks. Uh, there's it? over 60 national oh. parks. Is it your goal to go to all of them? Uh, my wife would love that if our family did that. Um, but we're already so far. So my kids in the last five years, I think we're at 24 with them. Oh, so nice. I've been to eight without them. And whether I was traveling or growing up, you know, other times. So, but in the last five years, we've done 24. We did three last week. Yeah, it was fun hearing you geek out about Mammoth Cave because I yeah. went there when I was a kid and I was like, this is nuts. And I mean, I live much closer to it um, and I pass it anytime. A lot of times on gear runs, actually going up to Chicago or Illinois. So that was yeah. cool to hear you guys go over there. Yeah, it's super cool. Uh, wait, no, I want to interject about this Bieber moment. Oh, yeah. You sat next to Bieber? Yeah, I hesitated putting that on there because I didn't want it to be. It's not a flex at all. I just I figured if I put that, you may pick it as the lie. And what what church was this? OK, so this was um, it's Judah Smith's church. But at the time, it was not a church. It was a it was really just a Bible study that he was doing at the Montage Hotel in Beverly Hills. Okay, so okay. my best friend moved to L.A. because his wife is an actress, okay? So she's in The Marvelous Miss Maisel, great show. Um, so he moved to L.A., and Judah had started... It, it was a church, but not really. It was in a like a banquet room of a hotel, and it started out pretty small, I think, and then it grew to... It was probably 200 people in this little banquet room, a little like six inch riser, no screens, no lyrics, you know, speakers on a stick from the hotel, wired SM58 microphone. Judah would get up and give a message. And here's how he would start it. He'd be like, hey, guys, my name is Judah. I'm a pastor. I'm going to talk to you about this book. It's called The Bible. Here's why I think what what is in this book is good for people and why I think it's true. Like he, it was that dumbed down for the kind of Hollywood celebrity uh, culture. Like Lee Fields. <clears throat> right. So then uh, my buddy, Tyler, was leading worship. And leading worship here was an acoustic guitar and a microphone, and you sing maybe a chorus three times, and that's it. Hmm. Well, I went with him one night. I sat on, like, second row or whatever. Um, but then they were going to do two services because it had grown so much. So in between the services, I'm like, I'm going to sit in the back in this one. So... 
everything's getting started. The room's filling up. Um, I go to the bathroom. I'm in the bathroom by myself and I'm washing my hands and I turn to walk out and Bieber walks in and by himself, no security. And you just do the like cool nod. It's just the like, you know what I mean? Just the, just kick your chin up a little and just like, I see you. If you don't say, Hey, but like, what do you do when like the most famous guy on the planet walks in? Like, that's all I knew to do was just like, Oh, Hey, because clearly we know each other. Like that's what it feels like. <laughs> Did and he recognize he, you? He was like, dude, I watch all the MXU stuff. No, not at all. <laughs> he just gave the nod back. And, and I would assume that's what you do if you know everyone who passes you on the street or in a bathroom knows who you are. It's got to be the weirdest feeling ever. So then I go back inside and I take a seat at the very, very back of the room. And the seat was holding up the door. So the door was swung open and there were two seats holding the door. And they're linked together, ballroom seats. So I sit in one. The one beside me is empty. He walks in and takes that seat. So we sat there for an hour, hour and 15 minutes, and he was at church. 300 people in the room. No one took his picture. No one asked him any, a single question, left him alone, no security. And then he went and got in his car at valet and left. That is so cool. And honestly, I bet yeah. he picked that seat, one, because it's in the back. So that's probably nice for him. Easy yeah. access to leave if you know things got weird. But two, you gave him the chill head nod. So he was like, oh. Okay, I'm safe with this guy. It'll be fine. Maybe. I didn't think about that, but maybe. Because that's the last thing you want to do. Like, Tim Tebow was in there, and, like, there's celebrities all over the place. So it's clearly not a don't come here to take pictures. I think Judah may have said that at some point. Or, actually, the singer of Laney, he Hmm. opened the service like a greeting. And one of them said it like, hey, this isn't a place for pictures or autographs. Like, we all got to have a place where we can go to church and not be bothered. That's what this is. Mm. Lee, I used to go to Austin Stone, and uh, this was back when uh, Tomlin had helped start it. And the pastor yep. got up, you know, one week I was there, and he was just sort of like giving a state of the union of the church and everything, and basically, you know, kind of laid out some like, you know, if you're here because this is where your family calls home, you are welcome. If you are in ministry at another church and you come here to get fed, you are welcome. He's like, if you're here doing the Chris Tomlin thing, we need your seat. It was just so cool. Like he's just calling cool. people out for just coming to to see Tomlin. Yeah, Tyler Perry did this, but it backfired on him. Or it was because of the negative experience. He stopped going to his church in Atlanta because people kept taking selfies of him from across the aisles, mm. and it weirded him out. And he's like, "I'm not going here anymore because you guys can't stop taking pictures of me and my family in church." That's a bummer. It, su- it sucks because. He's awesome. Like I, people make fun of the Medea movies. I think the Medea movies are amazing. They crack yeah. me up. Um, you know, I bet what wasn't funny was the perilous journey into business. So <laughs> tell us about. I'm trying to get us back on track. <laughs> Your segues are. Well, hilarious let's just today. keep derailing this. What else can yes. we talk about, Toby? To oh, just annoy Blake and like oh, screw his outline so over completely. I mean, just grab that piece of paper and set it on fire. Make fun of him for liking Medea movies. We could start with that. Uh, we could make fun of him for his. Um, his homemade mic stand out of books. So <laughs> clearly churches aren't giving you guys enough microphone stands. If no, you're having to put your true. S- SM7 on books. What can I say? I podcast much better when I'm on uh, five cocktail books. You know, <laughs> I got the death and Coke cocktail books. They inspire me to mix up the conversation. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a mixer on the board, but I am a mixologist. So I got to, okay. Gotta so be this game. is, this is the cool Christian 20 starter kit. It's the death and Coke cocktail book. It's the uh, horned rim glasses, the denim shirt, which I'm wearing a denim shirt Can today. You s- so, oh, did you say Death and Co? I did. Okay, Lee, Sorry. I am honored that you would ever even put me in the same breath as the cool kids in their twenties, <laughs> because I can tell you, the seventh graders at our church, like me and my wife, are with the seventh grade uh, group. They think I'm an old, old man, or at least hers tell her that. They're like, she's like Blake. To them, I, I might as well be fifty years old. <laughs> so oh, yeah, oh, I try to hang with my kids. And there's nothing I can do to be cool. And I'm not a dork, guys, but it does not matter. Uh, the and, cons- and I can't say the things that they say either. Like my son's 13. So today, him and his buddy, they're in the back seat of my truck. I'm driving them to school and they're playing um they're playing Clash Royale on their phones together. And uh Dakota, my son, goes, Oh, this guy's clutching up. It's awesome. And I'm like, clutching up. I'm like, he came in clutch and he's like, yeah, it's just a different way to say it. I'm like, okay, there's another one. They say big brain. Have you heard this one? Nope. 
when they do something that's like smart or like uh you know something that like takes some intelligence or some intuition they'll be like ah nailed it big brain Yes, my brain is swelling with with uh, knowledge. How great! My wife subscribes to this thing. It's called. It's like a translator for the you know the things kids are saying. It's like a cultural translator for adults. Ur- Urban Dictionary, but younger. Yeah, something like that. And the one I learned about most recently is Flop Era. Have you guys heard of this? No, it's, it's like the time when things went really bad for you. You call it your Flop Era. So I mean, that's. Blake, I mean, have you ever not been in your flop era? Oh, I've belly flop into every yes. you know pool I can find. I I have learned with with my seventh graders. I'm like, okay, I can't be cool and say the phrases, but I have to know them because like you do. They'll, they'll say them, and I'm like, okay, I need to know what you're saying. But I tried to say no cap, and then I just laughed at my own self. So <laughs> I was I was about to say that one. I will never say no cap. That's just, you were definitely I don't clutching think that one's down right now, Blake. Yeah, it was small yeah. brain when I tried to <laughs> cap up. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, you know the what does take a big brain is starting. A, <laughs> it's starting a company. You can't help but put that transition line in. Your eighth grade English teacher will be so proud of you right now. Look, I have so many emotional scars from the best but harshest English teachers, and they taught me a lot. You're you're noticing it accurately. Um, I yeah. just want you to know I tested out of uh, college English 100 because I was so good at it. So, so I big tested brain. out. I'm I'm clearly trying to divert the conversation again to talk about <laughs> remedial college classes. Remember that time Blake walked off the set of the podcast he loved so much. Um, was that today? No. <laughs> that's what, that's what I'm saying. All right, this is your last chance to talk about yourself. I'm going to move on. <laughs> we want to hear some some of the you know juicy bits of stuff. Okay. You know, not the not the Traeger get Grill juicy bits, but like the the beginnings of MXU making a you know, making a company to really serve tech directors and all for all jokes aside, we've talked to a lot. We do talk to a lot of tech directors and a lot of them have said things like, you know, back in my day coming up, we didn't have a resource. And when they say stuff like that, they'll always say MXU. They say a couple other names, but like it has meant a lot and done a lot for a lot of people. So what was it like making that thing, man? Okay. Well, the reason we did it is because like they're saying, there weren't resources. You could go to a conference or a trade show once a year to if your church was big and could afford it. But then even going to those trade shows, you don't go to learn or see gear. You go to go out to dinner with other people that do what you do and hang out in the hallways of the trade show with people and to meet maybe a famous engineer or something else like that. So myself, Jeff Sandstrom and Andrew Stone, we kept finding ourselves uh, invited to the same panels at these trade shows. Infocom, NAB, LDI, WFX, different things like that. And we loved food. So we would always find, or I would be the one assigned to find which steakhouse are we going to. And at dinner one night, it was the three of us. I think there were maybe a couple other people there. Jake Cody might have been there that night. Um, we're at the Bull and Bear restaurant at the Waldorf Hotel in Orlando, Florida, which used to have the best steak in America. They don't anymore. It's sad. It's gone down. Who does a little now? Bit. Best steak in America. Dude, there's a place in Orange County right now. It's um, in South Coast Plaza. So if you come out of the Westin Hotel and you look straight across the grass, there's another office building. And in the bottom of that office building is a Spanish tapas restaurant called Vaca, V-A-C-A, Spanish for cow. And they do the Argentinian style of reverse searing over open flame. And they use a citrus wood. So it's, it's imagine like an open flame grill, still grates, but then there's like a little, like a bridge on top of it that they can raise and lower. So they put the steaks on top at the highest point until the steak gets to 120 degrees internal. And then they remove it from that top layer, or you can crank it down and then sear it for about a minute on each side on the bottom. And then just a little sea salt on the top on the end. It is unbelievable. It's easily top three steak I've ever had, whether that's in someone's backyard or not. That's the best place right now. I just booked a ticket to Orange County, so you're going to have to handle the rest of this podcast by yourself. Nice. I'm going to take over the company in that time. Uh, When you get back, it'll it'll be all fixed, I promise. Great. I'm just kidding. I would break it. And we totally stumbled into this place and like took a bite of the steak, not knowing that this was going to happen, and then asked the server, like, what is going on? Like, this is unbelievable. And he was like, oh, yeah. A uh, chef, uh, he won 
top chef last year and he's a judge this season and he was the guy there cooking that night and we had no clue nice i i yeah. ended up in a gear run in dotham alabama which is a most random place ever and i had enough time to get lunch after i'd picked up from the churches and i was like when am i ever going to be here again and so i pull up dotham has is a very cute downtown like I just believe this, it's pronounced dothan but go ahead uh, dothan. i don't i didn't yeah. major in pronunciation just <laughs> transitions um but I am eating at this restaurant and I'm like, this is amazing in the middle of nowhere. And the waitress is like, oh, yeah, our um, our top chef won top chef. Like, I don't remember if it was 2019 or 2018, but like she had won yeah. pretty recently. And it, those are fun moments when you run into that. Yeah, that's awesome. So we're at dinner at the at the Bull and Bear in Orlando and. We were frustrated, not that there wasn't a resource for other people. We were frustrated that we couldn't go anywhere and learn because the three of us were obsessed with our own craft. We wanted to be the best that we could be. And showing up to a trade show and sitting on a panel talking about stupid audio crap is not the way to do that. So I had this idea uh, that we would go to a buddy's warehouse. It was actually the Amplio guys. So Jeff Vandergeesen, the founder, had just bought a space in Chicago and he had this warehouse. So I think I may have even texted him while we were at, at that dinner. And I'm like, hey, can Jeff and Andrew and I ship three consoles in and just take over your warehouse for a day or two? And we're just going to play our own tracks back. And it would give me the opportunity to stop Andrew and stop Jeff and say, hey, what are you doing to Tomlin's vocal or Stone? Let's what that reverb. I want to hear it by itself. Because you don't get another chance to do that. You can't go to hear Chris Raybould mix Bruno a few weeks in Vegas and be like, hey, can you can you solo that bass guitar? These 8,000 people won't mind. You know, you can't do that. So uh, Jeff was like, uh, Vandergeesen was like, yeah, sure, you can totally do that. And then I'm like, um, what if we rolled in a set of bleachers, like the little crappy bleachers you find in the back of a youth group, you know, those aluminum ones. That's literally what I had oh, in my yeah. head. Oh, tech. Yeah. And they, we, let, we get offers for those all the time. We, we buy them when we're buying the gear. Do you really? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we have been offered oh, pews. Yes. And choir risers. We get offered those choir risers a lot. That's funny. Um, so then I'm like, what if we put some bleachers in the back and we let people eavesdrop on that conversation? And then we're like, okay, wait a second. Let's do this in a public forum. Let's do it near a trade show. People are already coming into town. So we picked NAM because it's in Orange County. There's a ton of churches in Southern California. And we're like, let's just sell 100 tickets, 100 bucks, and just see what happens. And uh, the day before we hit 100, so it sold out, you know, quote unquote. A church sellout is you just call the number of how many you sold a sellout. Nice. So luckily we, we did that. We could have fit more people in, but we thought, let's just do 100. And we show up and we didn't know how we were going to set it up. We're like, well, let's just get in there and see what happens. Well, we're standing in the room. It was when one of the tents at Saddleback. So John Cassetto, the executive worship pastor there, let us use that room for free, which was awesome. And then we called a couple uh, manufacturers and partners and we're like, hey, well, you got sponsor. Help us buy our travel with us and an audio tech and a video tech. They all said yes, and all worked out. We show up in the room, and then when we decided, I think we should put these consoles in a circle. Like, it's the best way for us to look at each other. It's like, just like we're on Zoom right now. It's a, it was like a little triangle. And then we put the seats around us in a half circle, like 180 degrees. And we did the thing the next day, and we didn't really even have an outline. It was like, okay, Lee, you've got an hour. Go. So I would mix a song. It would take, you know, five or ten minutes. And then those guys would go, Hey, let's look at your bass guitar. Like it's weird. Uh, let's look at the vocal. Like we can make that better. So it wasn't a let me show off and how good of a mixer I am. It was I need to be a better mixer at the end of the day today than I was yesterday. And we all three did that. And at the end of the day, we go to dinner. And the question we asked ourselves whether we would do another one was would we have attended today? If we were an attendee, would we do that? And we've said yes every time, and we and we kept going. So it started off as just live events, and it was like a, just a little side hustle and a, and a hobby. And we just kind of gave the finger to the other trade shows of the world, and we kept doing them. Then we did one in Chicago with uh, the Philo Conference. Then we did one um, at Seeds Conference in Tulsa. And we just kept doing that. We did it for a couple of years. We did one in Stockholm, Sweden. There was a big group of 
uh, church tech guys there, um, and they're awesome. They invited us to come over, and we sold 130 tickets in Sweden. So we finished that weekend, and we're sitting at dinner in Stockholm the next day, and we're like, okay, like this is serious. Like we have a problem. That it's a very good problem. What are we going to do? No one wanted to travel all the time. We did not want to be an events company and travel all over the world constantly. We'd all toured. Jeff was uh, starting his exit ramp with Tomlin. Stone had been touring 20 years. I was doing the church thing full time, had no intentions of leaving. So then we thought, okay, let's put some content online and let's start a subscription. So the subscription thing had kind of blown up for, you know, Netflix and everybody else that had started it. Like, let's just see how it goes. So I called Adam Taylor at Central and said, hey, is there a five day period sometime in the spring where we could come in and shoot some videos? We'll use your video crew, your equipment, we'll put some gear on stage and we'll shoot some videos. He's like, yeah, sure. So we picked out the date. We fly there, we shoot 75 videos and it was all the stuff that we never could do in the event that people always ask. Like you're in the middle of, you know, dialing a Tom and someone would raise their hand and they'd go, what's a noise gate. <laughs> and we would literally turn around and say, we don't have time to answer that what, question. Was right that now. Blake? Oh yeah. I was at all of these, every, yeah. every single one, <laughs> even the Sweden one, man, that was a sweet Blake. Swedish what gig. is a noise gate? It is a thing that they put on me to keep from my voice, like coming through audio tracks. Hey, not bad. Oh, I was just guessing. It's close. Yeah. It's, it's, that is right in some ways. Um, so we decided, well, then let's put on these videos what everybody keeps asking that we never answer because we would even tell people like, hey, we don't have time to do that because this is for us. You guys are just here to eavesdrop and get inspired with cool mixes and to see us like, you know, show our dirty underwear and be humble about uh, trying to learn and get better. That's really what it was. So we shot video on what is EQ? What's a compressor? What's a noise gate? How do you lay out your channels on a console? What's a microphone? What's cardio? What's like super fundamental 101 stuff. And then at the next event, we told people that that was coming. We pre-sold some accounts and then we opened. And the first day it was, uh, I don't know, like a hundred churches signed up and we're paying us monthly for that resource. And it's just taken off from there. That was three and a half years ago. And now we have our own training facility in Tennessee being built as I woot, speak. Woot. And there's eight, eight full-time employees working on it. I'm now full-time. It's just freaking bananas. Now, I don't know if you read the news, but since you just said like basically your Netflix, did you hear that Netflix stock dropped massively yesterday? And can you attribute yeah, that to everyone leaving Netflix to go to MXU's, you know, for, <laughs> for the entertainment? So you guys have the best well, content in that space. You know what's funny? Like, maybe you read this, Toby, but like if you're a business owner and you read into that of what actually happened, it's total media BS. Really? I think. Yeah, they did lose subscribers. They lost 200,000 subscribers. Okay. They have 221 million subscribers. They lost 200 and the stock dropped $100 a share. But if you go to any news outlet today or any blogger and open Twitter, everyone's talking about how everyone's leaving Netflix. I'm like, is that less than 1% I was about to say, churn rate is a real thing. Like, as someone who manages an yeah. email list, like, you just, you no. lose people, you gain people. Like, that's, that doesn't even sound like that I, bad. Right. We, we have to research this because it's what we do too. And Netflix's monthly churn rate is 13% every month. They do, in fact, lose 13%. They just gain enough to overcome that. So they were projected to grow by 20% in the first quarter or 10% the first quarter. And they didn't, which is a ridiculous number to grow by when you're already at 220 million. So, so what I'm hearing is I need to get off this right now and just buy Netflix stock while it's down a hundred dollars. I would. Where's MXU stock at today? Uh, we're definitely, uh, we're, we're up there near Tesla. You know, I think we crossed a thousand dollars a share. Oh, the moment y'all moved to Tennessee, your stock quadrupled. I mean, welcome to the land of the free. It's a great state. Hey, I, I grew up there. You don't have to tell me. And about. are you trying to buy Twitter as well? No, <laughs> that's just Elon. I, yeah, just okay. Elon. The, Hope, hopefully he can save it. Was, was there any moments, uh, starting MXU where you were just like, you know, things you're a podcaster, you've told a lot of stories, had a lot of things, but is there any, is there any origin, you know, funny moments from MXU that people wouldn't know of like, ah, oh man, we really, you know, learned something here or did something new there. And that, that was fun. You know, that really helped us get off the ground or a big mistake or a big win kind of early on. 
Oh, you know, everybody has their fake it till you make it. Did, did you have a flop era? No, we have not had a flop <laughs> era yet. Maybe it's coming. Um, I mean, we certainly tried things that didn't work. You know, we, ha- we have all of that, but we've never had a season of not been growing. Like, luckily, it's been, you know, up and to the right. The, it just grows every single month, which is awesome. But the we did have a fake it till you make it kind of. I mean, it's just a little bit of growth hacking, I think. So when we went to go fund all of that filming that we did those first 75 videos, it was expensive. Fly five, six people to Vegas, pay crew, build a website. Like that's a lot of startup costs. But we bootstrapped the whole thing. We've never taken investment. We've never had to take Good a loan. You. We're debt free. Yeah, it's it's all it's all awesome. But how we did it was we sold uh, team accounts to churches, the unlimited user level. We pre-sold them at a discount at our Chicago event. So we said, hey, if you got to sign up today before you leave, you're going to get a big discount. And then this thing will launch in like three months. Well, we sold like $30,000 in subscriptions that day. And it totally paid to launch the subscription platform. 100%. That is awesome. Some people call that a Ponzi yeah. scheme, but some people call that betting on yourself. <laughs> yeah, it was risky, right? It was super risky. Oh, yeah. Okay, Lee. So I wanted to ask you this. Um, it seems like, you know, what you guys are doing at MXU as you're, you know, offering, you know, training videos for churches all over the country. Uh, you know, I grew up doing church tech in the 90s. And back then it was, you know, we had a 16 channel biamp mixer and just the basics. We had a still remembers like a sure SM 62, like the old school, you'd see the announcers at the basketball game holding this stuff. It's like tech was way different back then. What were yeah. some of the kind of those moments or those key people or churches that changed the culture of that, where tech became this new thing that, you know, the, the bar was raised to be able to support something like MXU to even exist. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. I, I have a very clear answer on this. I think about every 10 years it's changed and it started in, it started in the eighties with Willow Creek, but I think it took them longer to do what they were doing to affect as many people. So, but I think that really happened in the nineties when they opened that big room and then everybody wanted to be Willow Creek, you know, the, the set designs, the intelligent lighting, like just having a set design was a new thing. Like they were really one of the first ones to do that. There's some other churches that uh, did cool stuff like that. Like um, what's the Assembly of God Church in Phoenix, Tommy Barnett's church. Like they did like live animals on stage. It was very Mm. uh, pageantry. Like there were churches doing that. But Willow Creek was really the first. And then um, in the early 2000s, late 90s, North Point with multi-site video, they were one of the first to do the virtual pastor, the way that they did it. Life Church in Oklahoma was launching around the same time, but they were very low tech. It was small screens, SD, the PAs really tucked and hidden. They didn't invest a lot into technology. They just wanted, they were emphatic about planting campuses, but they were very clear on technology being the driver for that. And then with worship in America, Church on the Move, where Andrew was at, really changed everything around, I guess it was around 2010. And that was, now we're shooting video at 24P. The lighting is more concert style, but not like super flashy and just strobe lights everywhere. Like the way Daniel, Daniel Cannell was the LD there. Some people are too young to even realize that. Uh, The way they did everything there really set the bar. And then Bethel, was one of the first churches that really took video to another level. And then storytelling with uh, video, they just took that to a whole new place. And even what Bethel's done with broadcast mixing, like Luke is really, really, really good what he does and has made that accessible to a lot of churches. <clears throat> so they've really set the bar there. Um, I've talked about this recently. There hasn't been a a new wave of that. I I feel like we're, I was just about to ask you, yeah. What do you think is the next? Cause you say it happens about every 10 years. And I mean, what we've only had a couple of those phases and it's grown so much. So like, what are some trends or where do you think it's going next? Even if it's just some minor, some minor details or some, some guesses, some speculations. Yeah. And I don't want to leave anybody out. Like 
I, there's other churches I'm not mentioning that have definitely had their part in this. Like, oh, totally. We're, this isn't elevate, a comprehensive well, list, more just, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. But like what Elevation has done for online programming has changed church completely. Every aspect, every department of the church, right? Like their online experience. Transformation Church and Michael Todd have done that. Um, so th- there are those uh, other places. But what's next? I don't know. I I said this on a podcast of ours uh, recently, the MXU podcast. Have you guys heard of it? I haven't. You should tell us about um, it. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen a lot of innovation coming out of the church in the last two or three years. I think partly is because of COVID. Everyone just shifted to, we got to be online. So that's the focus. Like innovation was out the window. It was just mandatory to add new technology to get their stuff online. So now everyone's done that. Now black magic's made it possible for everyone to have 24 P and great cameras. And people are starting to figure out how to front light and their online mixes are getting better. Whether that's with pro tools or an X 32, like everything is just, getting up to the standards that the the willows the north points the church on the moves the bethels the elevations have they've all laid that groundwork now i don't think every church is doing it as well as those they're not they're doing pretty freaking good though they're getting really close but like what's next i don't know but um easter was promising i saw a few things that i was surprised by did you guys notice how many churches had greenery and plants on stage for Easter this yes, year? Yes, even down to my home church, like the ornate setup, because my church is probably medium, if not a little less than medium, but we had a beautiful like greenery setup. So there was that. Um, there's a guy named Chase Hall, who is a lighting designer. He came from Central in Vegas. That's where he cut his teeth. I'm not sure where Chase was at before that. He's a, he's a friend. I should just ask him. But he was there, and then he went to Passion it was there a few years, and now he's just a freelance lighting designer. But a church in Atlanta hired him called Free Chapel, Jensen Franklin's church. You guys probably heard of mm-hmm. that. The set that they designed looks like something that you would have seen um, at uh, the Grammys, like The Weeknd or a Kanye. Or uh, there's another designer. Her name's S. Devlin. She's very, very famous for like art installations and museums and concerts. Uh, well, what he did at a church I have not seen done before and he posted about it and I just commented on it like, dude, thank you. Like, I feel like we owe him for telling churches it's possible to do something like that. Mm. And there's another church called um, Mosaic in LA, Irwin McManus's mm-hmm. church. What they did for Easter was pretty cool. It's It's very, very left of center. Like the entire stage was a, I want to say it was a tan or a beige color. And he was wearing a tan or beige suit. The t- uh, projector and the screens were all, it was very like something you'd see uh, Kanye do. You know, it's still in that earth tone and, and taupe stuff. So I don't know that that's going to be for like every Baptist church in America. It's not going to work, but at least we're seeing people try. So you talked about North Point. I was at North Point last week and uh, Bre- okay. Brendan Petty gave me the like behind the scenes tour. Uh, that was wild. And you know, just yeah. like you were talking about them, like really cutting edge stuff 20 years ago that they pioneered that yep. live streaming stuff and the virtual pastor, you know, he told me all about that. He gave me the behind scenes tour and everything. So, I mean, my jaw just dropped it, you know, what they're doing, what they built there. Do you have like, you know, one or a couple, like that's your favorite church setups you've ever seen or been a part of? Oh gosh. Yeah, probably. Let me think. Um, I I really love when I see people doing amazing things with not much. Oh, so, it sounds like me at church gear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, really? I'm just kidding. What you've accomplished with uh, zero talent, Blake, is shocking. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, who does a lot with a little? You know what's cool? Hillsong in Sydney still using a PM1D at monitors. Yes. Like there's stuff like so that is, uh, that I see. Fellowship like, and Grapevine. PM1D at are monitors. Are they really? Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of that that I just like want to say like, good on you, you know, but at the same time, like, hey, you should probably replace that. You <laughs> it's know? still working, man. It's, That's a great desk. It's a little bit of, yeah, a little bit of both. It can, but, it can be intimidating though to like try new things, learn, learn a new desk. Um, totally. You know, speaking of like you're, you're, you know, in this interesting space because you've done this for so long and you know so much and yet 
you're teaching people. And like you're kind of, uh, as you said in that first story, the thing that was really inspiring to me was you guys just did your mix in front of everybody and was like, here's what I know, here's what I don't. And I almost think like a leader humbling themselves to such public degree of like, yeah, I don't know this thing. Uh, or these things and then teaching each other probably allows everyone to take that sigh of relief and like, it's okay if I don't know it all. I can ask someone. Um, yeah. And so that was really great. And uh, like speaking to that though, I want to I want to know like, what's your approach now when you're learning something new? Because I've I've heard you say uh, you're, you switch from a Yamaha board uh, to another board going out on the road. Like in those moments when you're learning a new piece of tech, whether it's for a tour coming up or if it's to teach on the, on the MXU platform, like, what is that like to be to be new at something? Yeah, I don't I don't think the approach has changed. I think it's more about a just ridiculous commitment to being detailed. And I'm not a real detailed guy. That's the weird part. Like I'm not I'm pretty unorganized. I don't stick to things for a long amount of time. I love to break the rules. But you sound like someone else like, I know that might be sitting who? next to oh. me. What? Never. So I I, I, I'm, I'm really not that detailed, but like you mentioned, I have to learn a new console. I'm doing this United tour on a, a quantum three, three, eight. I've mixed on Digicoast plenty. Okay. But it's always been one-off stuff or conferences or just fly into a show and, and you mix on it. Well, this is, it's a month. So I took the opportunity to really dig in. Like what does every tab of every menu do? And where's every single function on the on the desk. But I, I guess I do that with everything. Like when I'm trying to learn about a compressor, I don't just like, what is a compressor? Well, it, it, uh, compresses the, the signal and limits the, what can pass through it. You know, that's true, but I want to be able to know exactly the attack knob on the compressor is the amount of time it takes after the input signal has crossed the threshold before the compressor starts working. Did you just read that off of a dictionary? That was amazing. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. And I, I think that's what I'm trying to say is like, I, I need to know every single thing about every piece of gear I use because I, I, I consider myself more of a artistic or creative, like a musical mixer. Like I don't care where the high pass filter set but I want to know what 12 dB per octave means mm. because when I need to like put art on something or put, uh, want to change something, I want to, I want to be able to have the best tool and you can't use a tool. You can't use the right tool if you don't know what they are and what they do. So tell us about your setup for United. Uh, it's real simple. It's, it's a three, three, eight, there's a waves rack and that's it. And it's a big Adamson PA. So Corey Edwards is looking at you just shaking his head like amateur. I mean, a little bit, but that's funny you bring that up. And with what you guys do, I've talked to you about this before, Toby. I'm like, if you ever see any like cool outboard gear out at churches, like holler at your boy before you, before you go sell that stuff. Um, We did the MXU tour last year with Chris Raybold and Chris mixes for turn the radio on whoever's playing that's who he makes us for daggum um yeah it's he's the best of the best and he has a ton of outward gear well we all fell in love with it and it does make a difference and it it does in fact sound better um i've heard it firsthand now in multiple cities over the course of a month and i'm telling you it's different and then Corey rented out his rig and took it out with elevation and then Corey's like, oh gosh, this makes a huge difference. And, and it does. Well, now Corey and I are like, okay, let's go build a rack. So he and I are actually working on a little project together, which maybe more to come on that later. But yeah, we're super into that right now. But I I don't think I'm going to take anything out on the United thing because um, I'm finishing the tour that has already started. So their previous engineer, James, legend, amazing, he's mixed for them for... I want to say 16 plus years, um, he's transitioning to a new job. So he's, he's coming off the road full time. I think he'll still do stuff with them occasionally when he can, but it wasn't a, it wasn't anything bad or anything. It was just like, he's just been there a long time. 16 years on the road is a long time. Yeah. And so they've been touring for a month already. And then when I go out there, I'm just finishing the last half. So I'm inheriting all the gear it's staying on a truck. So there wasn't anything I could do to come in and change stuff. Cause, cause I would have just used my personal Yamaha console. That's, that would have been my choice. Is it a so PM1D? I, I 
<laughs> uh, no, no, it's definitely not. It's a Rivage. Um, yeah, so that's the gear. It's pretty simple. And James is really simple too. Thankfully, there's not a lot of, you know, complicated stuff that I needed to follow behind and, and keep. And he was really great. He's like, hey, just go build your own file. Don't even use this one. So that was awesome. Oh, that's nice of him. Nice. W- yeah. When you're out on these tours, Lee, there's got to be some moments when even if someone was to give you their own file or you have your own file where things just don't go according to plan. We love to hear disaster stories of like, and it, it doesn't have to be like someone that you know messed up or you or you can leave names off, whatever. Not looking to throw anyone under the bus. No, just please look, throw somebody under the bus. Nope, nope. Keep the tires on the bus blood free. I'm just looking for some chuckles. Um, and I'm assuming you've seen some of this stuff in your day. I mean, you've probably seen a lot of it at church. Yeah, of course. And it, and it doesn't have to be a tour. Wherever the best story comes from, whether it's on tour or or at the church that you mixed at for a while. Do you have any live sound disaster stories? Okay. Live sound disaster. Um, there's one story. It's just an interesting story. Uh, Christmas at Bayside. So, you know, Christmas is a big deal at any church. But the church hired this group of kids called the Silhouettes. Just ring a bell to anybody? Oh, yeah. I'm on, I they run a very big on TikTok. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> they no probably cap. are. Um, they were on America's Got Talent. They would all stand behind a big projector screen and make shapes out of their body. And it was cute. Like, oh, it's a Christmas song. And they make the shape of a Christmas tree and a kid getting out of the bed, opening presents. And it's just these little kids, like age six to 12. And there's like 50 of them. And they run around and the picture disappears That's a whole and then reappears. And there's this there's this cute holiday shape, and all the Karens in the audience love it, right? So there we had this group at the church, and they were staged uh, backstage on the loading dock, about to go on. That's kind of like where they were. Well, the production was so big, there wasn't enough power in the building, so we had to rent a generator to run some of something. I don't know, maybe it was all the lightings on a generator. Well, the dock door had to stay open because the feeder had to run outside. There was no pass through in the wall, right? So it's cracked open in December in Sacramento and it's not warm, but it's not, it's not 20 degrees, but it's probably 30 outside, maybe 35 degrees. Well, because it's so cold back there, the parents of these six year olds in, you know, leotards were like, oh, we got to get a heater for the kids back here. So they went and bought on their own space heaters and plugged them in Ooh. to the audio distro this is and not didn't good. tell anybody. Not good. I'm expecting and either this crank- to short circuit or something to catch on fire. Yeah, they plug in three or four space heaters, didn't tell anybody, and they're they're up before the service started, right? So doors are open, house lights are on, 2,000 people in the room, lights go out, big intro, build, 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 build. Lights on, kick drum, boom. Flipped all the power on the breaker for the PA. Lost the entire PA. Room full of people. Christmas Eve. Oh, no. (laughs) So then imagine troubleshooting that. So how do you determine what happened? Like that's never happened before. We've never had any issues with losing power. So there, people are like company switch, looking at the amps. There's no power here. Where does it go? And then you see space heaters (laughs) and you start doing the math. You're like... Oh, that's what happened. And then, you know, it takes a few minutes to get that fired back up. You turn the house lights back on, you send an MC out and you say, Hey, we're going to give that another go. And you just start it over from scratch. Like it never happens. So those darn stage moms, man. I was about to say kids are chaos, no matter where they're at. They're fun that, you know, it's great. Kids are the, the, the future of the generation, but they're chaos as well. They bring it. So th- yeah. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Blake, do we get to play our game now? I want to okay. play a game. Lee, I'm sorry for this. Okay. Oh, we have a, a segment called Who Said It? So okay. I feel like we need a little like, you know, segment music for this, but I don't know if we have it oh, yet. Oh, I did this with Dylan yes. when Dylan was on your podcast. That was the you first guys- time we ever premiered it with someone we didn't know, by the way. I was so nervous for that, but he was a great sport. So, yeah. Okay. So we have three quotes from people that know you and you have to guess great. who said it. So here they are in no particular order. This person wants to know if your Ravage consoles come with a jet ski or a dirt bike, or if you have to buy those separately. Next, this person says, you got to stop buying sneakers. I okay. And finally, 
This dude is a general. I like that. His new name is General Lee Fields. I know that one's Dylan Howell. He said last night at the Amplio party in Nashville, he was like, oh, Lee's going to know my quote immediately. So that's awesome that you immediately yeah, you did. Yeah. You Which delivered. is embarrassing of Dylan to not try harder. Well, Dylan, I think I'll get canceled if if people actually call me the General Lee now, though. <laughs> oh, <laughs> dang. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, maybe. Especially with right. your company being in Knoxville. Like, yeah, don't do that. Right. No, it's named after the car in Dukes of Hazard. That's there you it. Go. I'm just named after yeah. the car. Um, I need to stop buying sneakers. Literally everyone, <laughs> um, which I have stopped buying sneakers. Now I buy cowboy boots. Um, you got to come to Nashville, man. Leave California. You bring those cowboy boots, rock I, it downtown. I, I'm going to say Jeff Sandstrom. You're close. You do work with him. Oh, then it's Spencer. Yeah, that's Spencer. Yeah, okay. So Spencer is the reason I stopped buying sneakers. So that's why he said that. He was I was looking at a pair of sneakers maybe like a year ago and I was like, hey, should I buy these? And they were, I remember exactly what they were. They were Yeezy 700s. So they look crazy. And he said something to me like, Hey, you kind of look like a kid when you wear those. Mm. In a in a very loving, like, hey, I'm your friend. You're 37 years old. Stop buying Yeezys. Cap. And it like it hit me. I was like, He's probably right. So then I just started buying boots. I'm like, what's the sneaker equivalent for uh, a 37-year-old white guy? I'm like, I'll just buy boots. So now I have way too many boots. Um, the first one, what was it? What was the other uh, one? This person wants to know if your Revage oh. consoles come with a jet ski or a dirt bike or if you have to buy those separately. This could be a few different people that I've talked to about this. I like how you're consistently, you know, all these... All of these quotes have had multiple people that could have said them besides Dylan, which was obvious. But um, can I ask a hint? Yeah, um, he did give us another quote. So I'm going to give you the second quote and you tell me if that helps. Oh, so no, his, I never approved this. I hope this is OK. His other quote is this person wants you to stop showing him brands like Filson and I don't even know Lucis because he can't keep Luke. up with you. Luke Casey. Luke Casey. Yeah, okay. that's the that's that's the cowboy boots I buy. Um <laughs> Stop showing him brands. So and I've narrowed the list down to either Adam Taylor or Jay Desai. Ooh, you've got it in there. You gotta figure out which of the two. It's Jay. It was Adam. Uh, dang it. Yep. All right. You got well, no, you got one, one out, out of three. three. But Dil the other two, uh, you, you know, you know. That's you pretty close. bad. Dylan got all three. That was a tough bar he set. And speaking of tough D bars well, that Dylan, Dylan set. He is, Dylan has three friends. <laughs> oh, man. But Dylan right now is our number one downloaded episode. And oh, so yeah? he has, you know, set you up for a challenge. He's like, okay. I got to beat Lee. He literally said, I got to I got to I got to get to the top spot before Lee comes on. Yeah. I was like, well, don't count yourself out, buddy. He's like, I got to get to the top spot before Lee comes on. Well, he'll he'll stay there as long as I don't tell anyone about it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell. Don't. Yeah. We already put Bieber's name in the title, so I actually don't up. do that, please. <laughs> Bieber's did you best, already title it? No. Bieber's best friend. Bieber, no, we we actually don't even title these until right as I'm about to post it. I have to listen back to it, and the title just kind of yeah. kind of comes to me. Oh. Great, C cowboy boots and jet skis. There oh you go. My gosh, yeah. And Tim Tebow. You're welcome. I've named a few podcasts before. So then, uh, tell us about some gear setups, like some of your favorite that you've ever seen. Because I mean, it sounds we like we already did this question, Blake. What? No. He told us some of them, but I don't think we'd actually ask the question directly, did we? I did, but he kind of skirted. He was like, I you, like you ask, you know, churches that are doing a lot with a little kind of Well, that was the trends. Oh, you mean like if I'm mixing, what would be like my dream gear setup? I could tell you that. How oh, about that? Let's, let's do, do that. that. Build okay. your dream setup. It would be an outdoor show with a DMB GSL PA. Um, there would need to be about ten thousand people there. <laughs> um <laughs> I would be mixing on, I'd mix on a Rivage. That'd be what I would choose. In cowboy boots? <clears throat> For sure, I'd wear my uh, Cayman Belly Black Cherry cowboy boots. Um, outboard gear, I would not use any plugins. I would mm -hmm. use, what would I use? Some 1176s, an LA-2A. Some R2-D2s, some 729s. <laughs> all, all that stuff's in the console, but yeah, I mean. Yeah. Bunch of distressors. Bunch of impressors. I haven't, I haven't used the distressor a ton. I want to use SSL's new Bus Plus. It came out yesterday. Mm. 
So they took their classic SSL compressor, put it in a two space rack and then added dynamic EQ to it. Whoa. Yeah. And it's like 2,700 bucks. So wow. Just tell them to send it to you for free and you'll make a post about it. Come on. I would use a Bricasti reverb, but there's one on the desk also. Okay. Let's like if I'm building an outboard rack right now, because that's a fun thing to talk about. Sure. I would do the, um, I do a converter, the Burl converter. I would do, uh, that bus plus, even though I've never used it, um, an API 2500, just in case I couldn't figure out how to get the bus plus to work. And then I would use, I'd put some distressors in there cause that's mm-hmm. fun. Um, a Bricasti reverb, a 2290 delay, a crane song, a couple of those saturation. Why not? I would put an API lunchbox in there and fill it full of goodies. Okay. With some like Shadow Hills EQs and compressors. Any Neve stuff? Yeah, I would use the uh, the Neve summing mixer, the tabletop one. And it's four channels, so I'd send, I think it's more than that. I would send all my band groups into that, and and the master of that would be the band, and then sum it back with the vocals probably on the desk. Something cool like that. Mm. Sweet. Let's just get our elves at church gear to build this thing for you. Oh, yeah. We'll Not ship it problem. out to you. Yeah. It might. That's probably only like 60 grand. Yeah. For I mean, gear. the distressor might look a little bit like a DBX 266, but just don't <laughs> worry about that. Perfect. Uh, nice. Well, um, st- also speaking of something that would de-stress a person, it's uh, having some more knowledge for their Sunday services to be better. And we get that on the tech takeaway at the end of each episode. So I'd love to hear from you. I mean. You're the grandmaster of wisdom himself, the, the person at MXU making generally the, general. The, well, hang on, we can't get our boy canceled. Um, <laughs> that was one word, generally. Yes, generally, you're consistently great at teaching brilliantly. So, um, could you give us just a tech takeaway of yours of like this is something you could do to make every Sunday uh, service better, and it could be philosophical, could be technical. You know, it's just high level tech takeaway. Yeah, I'll give you one of each. Um, oh, even better. Turn the vocals up and the tap delay down, just in general. I've said that before. And the philosophical one is write down five hard conversations that you're avoiding having and do one a month for the next five months. Go Mm. dig for that conflict and mine for it. Pray about each one, but those issues, those conflicts that you're avoiding, conversations with your boss, a coworker, something you're not happy about, maybe it's something with at home with your family, R- write down five of them and have one a month for the next five months. Man, that's so good. Have you been noticing that a lot? Like the hard conversations getting avoided? Yeah, I think a lot of people are quitting their jobs right now because of one of two things. Uh, they need to quit and it's good that they are or they're afraid of having difficult conversation and they're leaving jobs that they shouldn't quit. So it's really easy right now because there's such a big exodus happening in every employer to say like, well, it's just an exit happening and people are finally leaving unhealthy churches and toxic teams. But I think it's probably equal toxic teams and people need to leave. And then people aren't willing to have difficult conversations because I think a lot can change with those conversations. I think most pastors don't want to see tech guys overworked and working 80 hours a week. I think most of them do not. I think we're putting that on ourselves, and we feel like we're, we need to prove something to somebody so that we create work for ourselves, or we think we need to work 80 hours. And in fact, we don't like the demands that we feel like the churches are putting on us. We're actually putting on ourselves. That's not in every case, but I think it's a lot of them. And that almost, that could be y'all's next challenge. The, the five month, five conversation challenge right there. And I bet that'd help a lot of people. We, we've, Maybe. we've run into a surprising amount of that, honestly, because, you know, we're not working for the church. We're just helping the tech director. We, we end up being a good, easy place for them to open up. And I, it, I have been surprised at the amount of like overwork and burnout. I mean, I know that's r- running rampant everywhere in every sector, but I'm like, man, I'm sure as you say, like you're, if your pastor knows all that, like, I, I bet they don't want that for you. Like, yeah. Pastors are busy, but really good people. And if they probably don't know it, but they would, you know, definitely try to help if they knew. Someone I, I know pretty well, and I know the church he's at pretty well, texted me yesterday and said, how much of my burnout do you think is because of me? And how much is because of the organization? 
and I said, it's 100% you, 100% the organization. It's actually <laughs> both. I think you'd have this problem anywhere you went, but the organization you're at is also taking advantage of you. So that's a conversation you need to have with them about demands, but you got to figure out why you do that. Like, why are you trying to prove yourself to someone? It is a tricky line of like, is this, do I need to leave this place because it's so unhealthy and will never change? Or yeah. is this place unhealthy, but I could be the change here? I mean, culture can begin and start with one person. And so, yeah, I, I love that as yeah. a takeaway. Hopefully this can it, be the beginning of some rebuilds. It can, Blake. I've never seen it change from the middle of the organization. Mm. I, it, I, it might be possible with a really gr great leader, but man, it's hard to change from the inside or from the middle out. It's, it's really top down. It really is. Man, well, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good challenge, man. I hope people take you up on that. Me too. Well, Lee, tell us some things uh, that you'd like to plug. Plug uh, the subscription service. Got any live events coming up? I mean, what's going on in Lee Field's life? Yeah, we've got the MXU Live Tour coming this fall. Tickets are on sale. We're going to be in Chicago, Atlanta, and Dallas. And the biggest news for this one is we're joined by a different band this year. Pretty excited about this, guys. Uh, we have John Sal and his wife, Jenna, from Elevation Church is the band this year. So freaking stoked about that. And you guys are going to be out there with us, hanging out. Oh, tech, yeah, tech, we're going to be there. yeah, we're going to be there. Tech, yeah, that's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> oh, what else? Uh, the subscription, yeah, MXU. If you subscribe to MXU, it's over 500 videos, audio, video, lighting, leadership. You can sign your whole team up. You can send people on your team assignments. You can create playlists, your own custom content for your team. It's really a no-brainer. It's super cheap. Like, literally any church can afford it. We've tried to make that possible. So go check it out. Get mxu.com. It'll definitely help you be a big brain, and you'll avoid your flop era. Yeah, no, no cap. cap. <laughs> Love it, man. Well, Lee, thanks for coming on, dude. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. And hey, congratulations on Surviving Sunday. If you happen to make it through next Sunday as well, join us again for your weekly Tech Breather. Uh, Blake, I made a list of my five hard conversations that I need to have over the next five months. And how many of them do you think revolve around you? Oh, I was hoping at least all five of them. All five of them. Yes. So number one, it's my frustration of you not telling your friends about our podcast. I know. I've only been uh, posting on social. I haven't been texting them. I need to text them to, to check out the podcast. I, I would I would recommend that. That's going to be conversation number one. Yeah. And you know what? If you're listening to this right now, let's have a hard conversation. You love this episode. You're at the end. You know you loved it. Text it to a buddy. Who's your, who's your tech director buddy that's like, this person needs to hear it. Text it to him.